Alrighty, everyone, welcome back to Final Fantathon, our quest to casually let's play every single mainline Final Fantasy game, plus some bonuses. It has been such an incredible journey through the retro Final Fantasies, and now we are finally taking the plunge into the modern age with Final Fantasy VII. And uh, this run is going to be, this playthrough is going to be a lot different. Uh, all of the playthroughs up to this point and all the playthroughs after this are going to be quote-unquote casual Let's Plays. Um, the ones after this aren't necessarily going to be completely blind, um, but they are going to be casual. I'm going to play through them as if I've never played them before. We're going to keep it mostly spoiler-free and enjoy the story as it plays out, right? But Seven's going to be different. Uh, for those of you that maybe have not been around the channel for very long or just watching this for the first time, um, I'm known for being the Final Fantasy VII guy. I've been making Final Fantasy VII content for somewhere around the ballpark of 13 years now. Um, I've done speedruns of it. I've had the world record in the PC categories and even tried out like the bigger categories as well. Um, I've done challenge runs of it for the past 13 years. I've done in-depth playthrough or uh, in-depth um, lore guides. I've done theory videos. I've done pretty much everything there is to possibly do with Final Fantasy VII. Um, so doing a casual let's play throughout the game just doesn't really fit, uh, you know, what we've done with the game already. It would just feel kind of empty because we've done so many crazy playthrough. I mean, we played two Final Fantasy VII's at the same time with one controller. We did an entire playthrough with only Cloud and one bar of health. I mean, just, we've done insane stuff. So to do just a playthrough where we pretend like we've never played the game before and try to keep spoilers out. Just doesn't really fit the mood of, you know, what we've done with Final Fantasy VII up to this point. So, instead of doing a casual Let's Play, we're going to do something completely different. We're going to do something that I am calling an in-depth playthrough of the game. So, what we're going to be doing is going through the game with spoilers completely open. We can talk about anything we'd like from the story. And we're going to... Very, you know, with, with a fine tooth comb, go through every single scene and every single part of the game and just talk about anything and everything we can think about. I'm going to be talking about the uh, coding mechanisms that they used in the game. Uh, some of the really weird, funny glitches and stuff that comes from the coding. I'm going to be talking about the enemy AI. I'm going to be talking about the lore and different things that show up at the beginning of the game that are talked about later and different connections you can make. We'll be talking about the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, the games that came after um, Final Fantasy VII was released, and the movies and all that. Um, pretty much everything we could possibly think about, we're going to talk about, uh, and just try to get everything out. You know, every, every cool, every interesting tidbit we can think of. Um, I also have some people in the chat that I've asked to try to be here for most of the Let's Play um, that can throw in their ideas as well, because there's so much in Final Fantasy VII that. Obviously, I'm not going to remember every single thing. I'm going to talk about everything I can think of that's interesting. Um, but there's going to be some stuff that I miss. So uh, I'm going to have people in the chat as well throwing out their little tidbits that they know, their little fun facts that they know about certain things. Uh, and yeah, we're just going to go through the whole game like that. We're going to um, probably... It's not going to be the longest playthrough ever because I know exactly what I'm doing. But uh, I am going to try to make it a bit longer. Um, I'm not going to like do a hundred percent playthrough. I'm not going to pick up every single item in the whole game or anything, but I am going to show everything I can think of to show that's at least somewhat interesting. Um, and yeah, so for the game, we are playing the original black label. Um, I own probably 13, 14, 15 copies of the game. Um... Everything from the original Japanese version to the misprint version to the original release uh, unopened to uh, the PC, the original PC version, not the Steam version, but the original actual PC release. Um, but this is the most standard to play, just the, the original black label. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it to say. And we're playing it on a PS2. Normally I'd play on a PS1 just to be as original as possible. But the PS2 is a bit better to record. It's just a little clearer because I can do it through SCART. And the PS2 plays PS1 games the same exact way as the PS1. So it's just better to play on PS2. Um, but yeah, we're going as original as we can. Original version on original console. 
and getting upscaled through SCART. It should look good. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the game has not aged super well. Um, none of the PS1 RPGs have, but uh, it'll look as good as it can possibly look. Yeah, Death You Handsome in the chat. And I think that is it. So let's get started with this in-depth playthrough of my fi favorite game of all time, Final Fantasy VII. Let's do it. You know, whenever we talk about the best version of Prelude, no one ever brings up Sevens. You guys don't think this is the best version of Prelude? Hmm. I don't know if I want to play that stretched. going to be too stretched. I'm okay with a little bit of stretch in Final Fantasy VII, uh, but that's too much. It's a little bit stretched, but I'm okay with a little bit of stretch. I just don't want everyone to look like they're Palmer. <laughs> the, the Palmer mod, everyone's Palmer. Continue. Shouldn't have any saves. Oh man, this is wild. So, I have not played the PS1 version of Final Fantasy VII in a very, very, very long time. I've booted it just to try, like, glitches and stuff, or, like, there's certain reasons that I've booted it. But just actually sitting down and really playing it, I have not done in many, many years. So this is going to be a, a trip for me. Here we go. It is time to start our in-depth quest. I can't wait for the three pixels. Uh, Latal, I see your $77.77 donation. Holy cow, thank you so, so much. Uh, this is the game that made me a fan of the series, and you never cease to amaze me with your knowledge. Here, Lucky Seven's going toward a fantastic in-depth run. Thank you so, so much. I'll play that in just a minute after the opening cutscene here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I don't think I have too much to say about the opening cutscene, actually. Uh, obviously, it was really 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 iconic uh this picture though i love so much it's like one of my favorite things about the game is that that moment there where you see Aerith's face because uh at the very end you also see that same exact picture it's what the game starts with and it's what the game ends with which i always thought was cool um yeah it's like full circle but other than that, uh, there's the Loveless poster. Which, uh, I don't know a ton about Loveless. Um, you learn a lot more about that in Crisis Core. There it is. If anyone knows any cool stuff about Loveless, you can at me. But, uh... 
It was named after it was named after an album of a band that the developers liked, I think. Or a song. I don't want to say too much because I don't remember. Oh my god, the crap. The Garfix! I could almost see Jesse's face. <laughs> oh my god, look at Barrett's look at Barrett's face. Oh no. Look at those eyebrows. Were the green orbs flying around are meant to be materia? I don't think so. It's an old an old opera that's miss parts missing, but they still show it. Yeah, there, there's a bunch you can go into with Loveless. Like, there's a lot that goes into it, but I don't know all of it, so. Yeah, the low res text, too. Look at my arms. Look at my non existent mouth. Oh boy. Alright, real quick. Give me that lucky seven. Look, Death UF has more pixels than Cloud. Those dead eyes. <laughs> okay. Oh man, the menu load feels so feels so slow. Okay. Uh. What do we want to do for window color? I should do the classic that I always used to do when I was a kid. This is the classic I used to do when I was a kid. Gotta go maximum edge lord. Eight years ago. I've been happy to have you here for a whole eight years, man. Uh, okay, so... Um... I'm gonna play an active, but I'm actually not gonna play with fastest battle speed. To make it a bit more casual, let's play-ish. And I'm going to keep the battle message slower as well, so we can uh, actually read the messages. Alright. There's a po two potions on that guy. Super Easter egg. So field message is, like, not really used a ton. But basically when the characters talk in battle, like when Cloud says... Attack while it's tails up. If you set that to fast, that message will go by faster. It's only used, like, man, a few times throughout the whole game. Oh, field, you said field message, not battle message, message. Sorry. Field message is just every text box. Every text box when you talk to people. And during cutscenes. Oh my god, running on the... Running on the... <laughs> D-pad is hard. Okay, so, first uh, fun fact, you can skip this scene. Uh, even on the original PS1 version, you can skip this scene. Uh, the way you do it is you line up on this wall, pixel perfect. Run all the way down to the wall, like this. And then there's a bunch of sub-pixel manipulation you do. And basically, you can run through that door, and that door doesn't actually have collision. It's just there as like a model, but there's no collision on it. Uh, because right after you talk to Jessie, she opens it, so they didn't think it was necessary to put collision on it. So if you can get close enough to the door, it'll send you to the next screen, and you'll skip this whole part where you talk to Avalanche. Um, if you do that, Cloud never gets his name. So his name is permanently X-Soldier, but there's kind of a funny coding mechanism they put in place with this name, because your name's only supposed to be seven characters, or wait, nine characters, 
Uh, but X Soldier is more than that. It's what, 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, it's 10. So you're supposed to only have 9 characters. But for this one part of the game, they made a special exception where Cloud's name is 10 characters. So after this scene, if you don't name Cloud, his name stays X Soldier, but the game sets it to 9 characters. So his name is X Soldi, and the R gets dropped. So for the rest of the rest of the game, his name's X Soldi. Uh, and Barrett never gets his name as well, so he gets his default name, which is Barrett. So, uh, yeah, so you're stuck with X Soldi and Barrett for the whole game. Soldier, aren't they the enemy? I gotta, I gotta remember that I'm reading the text because I, dude, it's been so long since I've read the text. <laughs> What's he doing with us at Avalanche? Hold it, Jesse. He was in Soldier. He quit them, and now he's one of us. Didn't catch your name. I'm Cloud. Cloud, eh? I'm. It doesn't matter what your name is. I don't care what your names are. Once this job's over, I'm out of here. Heck you all doing? I thought I told you never to move in a group. Our target's the North Mako Reactor. We'll meet in the bridge in front of it. Soldier. Ex-soldier, huh? Don't trust you. How many people pronounce Barrett's name Beret when you were a kid? Well, that's Beret. The name's X. X Soldi. How's it going, Dean? Good to see you, man. So, fun fact about Barrett. Uh, his original name was Barrett, but when they did like advertising for the game. The English translation of the advertisements made his name Bullet. And then later they were like, oh crap, that's dumb. And they changed it back to Barrett. And it's not clear if Barrett's name is actually a uh, reference to the gun company. Or if that's just a coincidence. But it could be. And I believe it was also spelled with like a different spelling at one point too. Oh, there was a there was a miss uh, spelling in one of the advertisements as well. With his name was two R's and two T's. Yo, this is your first time in a reactor? No, after all, I did work for Shinra, you know. The plant is full of Mako energy. People here use it every day. This is the lifeblood of this planet, but Shinra keeps sucking the blood out with all those weird machines. I'm not here for a lecture, let's just hurry. That's it, you're coming with me from now on. Yeah, so, uh, that's kind of a, a general, a general thing we can talk about. One really strange thing, so, <laughs> okay, let, let's just, let's just put this out there. This game is probably the weirdest, most weirdly coded game in existence. Uh, which is why there's so many glitches and ridiculous stuff, and why modding is such a popular thing in the game now, and we've even created our own mod. But, uh, yeah, the coding in this game is completely whack. First of all, the game runs at three different FPS's, and it also runs three different modules. Uh, actually, there's four, depending on what you're doing. So, it's almost like they coded four separate games and connected them all together. Uh, there's the field um, module, and then there's the battle module, 
and then there's the mini game module, and then there's the world map module. And all those modules are separately coded and pretty much like combined together. And so whenever you're on a field and a battle starts, it actually collects some information about where you are, what your step count is, whether or not it should be a, a pincer attack, stuff like that. And then it sends that information to the battle module. And then the field module turns off, and the battle module turns on, and then it does the battle in like a separate, you know, like, I, I don't know what the, like a separate cell, you know, away from the rest of the code and the rest of the game. And the battle happens, and then it sends the information back, your your HP, your MP, whether or not you died, etc, etc. Sends that information back to the field module, battle module turns off, and then field module turns on. And uh, the whole game is coded like that. And it's one of the reasons why battles run at a different FPS than the field module. Uh, the world map runs at a different FPS. And that's also why the resolutions are different. If you've ever noticed when you're playing the Steam version, whenever you're like in a menu or in a battle or on the world map, the resolution is different. And uh, if you've ever streamed this game before, it's probably annoyed you because you set the, the like your box to maybe a battle and then you come out and you go into a menu and half the menu's cut off. And then you set it to that and there's a big black bar when you're in a battle. Uh, that's why, because they're all different resolutions. Um, one thing that these old PS1 RPGs did very often is they would have the menus run at 60 FPS, but that they would have the rest of the game run at 30. And the reason they did that is because they wanted the menus to be more fluid, but they couldn't run the whole game at 60 FPS because the PS1 wasn't super powerful. So they would actually run two different FPSs, so the game could run at 30 and be pretty fluid and not lag, but then the menu could do 60. Legend of Gaia, let's go. Speaking of PS1 RPGs. Um, I'm actually, the game looks a bit loud too. Let me turn it down a little bit. Um, so the menus, because all it is is just text and stuff, they were able to run that at 60 FPS no problem without any lag. So they would split the FPS. And that, that's another module in this game too, is the menu module. So I guess there's five. World map, menu, battle, minigame, field. Little by little, the reactors will drain out all the life, and that'll be that. It's not my problem. The plane is dying, Cloud. I'm not gonna let it get to me. <laughs> The only thing I care about is finishing this job before security and the RoboGuards come. Get help. Yeah, and then there's Colonel, which does like the user input. But yeah, many, many uh, PS1 RPGs <coughs> would run the the menu in a different resolution and a different frame rate. Uh, Chrono Cross is a great example. Where the uh, the menu runs at a different resolution and a different frame rate. And I know that because my old capture card used to have a nightmare recording Chrono Cross. Because every time the resolution changed, it would be like, oh crap, we have to change resolution. So I'd get like this huge flicker every time I opened up the menu. Yeah, so uh, I should talk about the original releases of the game. There's obviously the newer releases like the Steam version and the, uh, the PS4 version. Steam, or, uh, Switch version, all that. But, in the beginning, there was only three versions. There was the Japanese version, and then, very shortly after that, the North American version, which is what we're playing. Um, this was the first, well, not the first game, 
but um, they planned this game specifically to be released worldwide. A lot of the original Final Fantasies weren't like that. Um, the previous game, Final Fantasy VI, was like that, but it was a bit more complicated. They released it as Final Fantasy III, and I don't remember how long it was after the Japanese version that they released the English version, but I don't think it was, like, right away. Um, this game, from its inception, was planned on being a worldwide release, and they planned on calling it Final Fantasy VII everywhere. Their goal with Final Fantasy VII was really to make it a worldwide thing, starting with this game. Um, so, but interestingly enough, there are some changes between the English version and the Japanese version. They added two super bosses in Emerald Weapon and Ruby Weapon, and they fixed a couple weird things. Funnily enough, it's not even, I mean, there's still a bajillion glitches, but there was some, like, very specific things they fixed for some reason. Um, there was a debug fight that I'll talk about way later that you can actually access in the Japanese version. Uh, that they took out in the Medeal Desert. Um, and then they also lowered the encounter rate, which I think they did that to make the game easier. Or, I said Medeal Desert. The um, Coral Desert. <laughs> Medeal doesn't have a desert, it's like a tropical island. Um, so they, lo they lowered the encounter rate on the NA version, because I think they wanted to make the game easier. It was very uh, common for Square to make their English translations of games easier. They thought that we sucked at RPGs and we needed it to be easier. So they lowered the encounter rate, but inadvertently actually made the game harder because when you get less encounters, you just casually get a lot less experience. And so the bosses just end up being harder without as much grinding. And the um, random encounters in this game, for the most part, aren't very difficult. It's not like the, the retro games where random encounters can very easily kill you if you run into the wrong one. Um, this game, the random encounters are usually pretty easy. So having less of them actually makes the game quite a bit harder because you end up just getting less experience and less money and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that's what they meant to do. It is pretty nice, though, because all of the games before this had really, really high encounter rates, and it's really nice to play one with a much slower encounter rate. I don't know how bad it is on the Japanese version. I've never really played the Japanese version for an extended amount of time. Uh, but it would, it would probably feel really weird to me playing it. It would probably feel like there's way too many encounters. There's a lot of jank with this screen and this ladder. Mostly only a problem in the Steam version, though. Hey, Kelowna, thank you so much for the three months, by the way. And Bunker, thank you for the 37 months. Holy cow. Thank you, thank you. It's my turn to backseat the chat. Let's go. How's it going, Arco? Yeah, there's some issues with ladders in this game. Um, there are multiple you can soft lock on. It doesn't happen as often in this game as it does in uh, the Steam version. But it can still happen. And basically the reason is because of the way they coded ladders. Basically if you're in range of it and you press circle it will um, it will make Cloud walk towards the ladder until he reaches it and then start climbing it. So if there's something in your way, you can get soft locked. Also, we should talk about Circle being confirmed. So a lot of people played this game when it first came out and they were really, really confused because Circle is confirmed instead of X. Uh, most people know this, but Circle is confirmed in Japan. Always has been. Um, and it still is to this day. They still use Circle as confirmed for most RPGs. And then they change it when it comes over here to X. 
Uh, but for whatever reason, I guess they thought maybe they'd try it to see if maybe it would stick in, in North America. The, I mean, this was still the the age of, of RPGs being pretty new. So they were just kind of throwing everything on the wall and seeing if it stuck. So they decided to, to keep it as Circle to see if maybe we would catch on. And apparently, it, apparently we hated it or something because this is the only time they ever did it. <laughs> they changed it back to X after this for every game after this and even other series like um, Kingdom Hearts they continue to change the button over one of the uh, one of the biggest arguments one of the biggest lore arguments we have over and over again, every time we see this scene, is who's talking to Cloud here? When we blow this place, this ain't gonna be nothing more than a hunk of junk. Cloud, you set the bomb. Shouldn't you do it? Just do it. I gotta watch to make sure you don't pull nothing. Fine, be my guest. So this part here... It's Sephiroth. Watch out! This isn't just a reactor. So it's like one of the weirdest parts. Um, because... Pretty much every other message throughout the game is more of a foreboding message that definitely makes it seem like it's Genova or Sephiroth. Uh, but here, it's like Warning Cloud, so it makes much more sense it would be Zack. Um, but, you know, the theories, the theories usually fly all over the place because Zack doesn't really talk to you much other than this, so it's weird that he talks to you here. And there's also other possibilities it could be. It could be his subconscious. It could be him talking to himself in Zack's voice. It could be a million different things. Sephiroth. What's wrong? Huh? It could be his real self. There's a lot of different things it could be. What's wrong, Cloud? Hurry it up. Yeah, sorry. Oh, by the way, <laughs> it, uh, another thing with the whole Circle X thing, when the PS4 version came out, um, they made X confirm and Circle cancel, and they didn't give you a way to change it. And it was the worst thing ever. And if you ever watch my Times 3 playthrough, I spend the first like three episodes complaining about it. <laughs> and that's why we have a meme, why is it X? because the very first time I played that version, I was so frustrated. Alright, Guard Scorpion, everyone's favorite boss. So, Guard Scorpion is pretty cut and dry, but I always loved how, like, in depth his mechanics are for being a first boss. He scans the target and then always hits that target so you can like block ahead of time. And then he also has the counter attack which you actually really have to be careful of because it will kill you. Even though this is the first boss you will die if you don't pay attention. So I just thought that was cool. They kind of tell you right off the bat hey we're not screwing around like not going to be an easy journey. I still think this is the easiest of all the games, but... <laughs> yeah, I always thought Guard Scorpion was a great first boss. So he does two rounds of Search Scope and two rounds of his shot, and then he lifts his tail. And this is the, the biggest meme of the game here that everyone knows. Cloud says, Barrett, be careful. Attack while its tail's up. It's going to counterattack with its laser. <laughs> and a lot of people read that as, okay, attack him. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure I did too when I was a kid. Like, attack while its tail's up. All right, let's go. So one, one advanced mechanic in this game that I always loved 
is that limits ignore all other actions. They will interrupt everything. So usually it's a good idea to like queue up other things and then use a limit because it'll stop everything and use it. There's a lot of like advanced mechanics you can do with limits. Usually like fastest active will make limits even more useful. Here not so much, but Yo, how's it going, Brendan? Good to hear. Good to have you here, man. If you have any uh, fun facts that you want to throw in, feel free. You don't need to view a tail laser. You've seen it. There was a speedrun strat a long time ago where people would on like uh, purposely get tail laser to get limits, but that was like a million years ago. Don't do that anymore. So, what can I say about this part? The timer has an interesting coding mechanism attached to it because it has to persist through all of the different, uh, all of the different, um, what did I call them? got the word I used. The different like field uh, battle world map modules. That's what I'm looking for. So the, the timer has to persist through all the modules. So they had to kind of code it pretty interestingly to make that work. And uh, because of that, I believe like one of the first things that gets really glitchy when you're modding this game or like messing around with the code is the timer. <laughs> I know a lot of mods like struggle to get the timer to work right. Oh, you're talking about what limits can't interrupt? So I think the only thing that hold on, let's see what Zuwa said. Yeah, counterattacks. Um, also, um, W item, like W item, W summon, that stuff. I believe it doesn't. Uh, Quadra magic, it doesn't. So one popular question I get is, do you have to rescue Jesse here? Which is such a weird question, because, like, I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know how it became a, like, myth that you could somehow get out of here without Jesse. But I get that question all the time, like, can you leave without Jesse? Like, I remember when we were doing the speedrun, I'd get that question all the time, like, hey, why do you stop to get Jesse? Like, uh, because I have to? <laughs> You're dead if you don't. Yo, Shahir! Thank you for the five months! Yeah, if you don't rescue Jesse, you get up to the top and uh, Biggs is like, Where's Jesse? We don't have the code to the door! But funnily enough, that's still a question that I get all the time. I think what happened basically is that people played through the game once and they saved Jesse because they wanted to, but they never actually knew if he needed to or not. So that's probably why it's a popular question. These doors? No, they have hard hitboxes. I'll show off as many glitches as I can, but nothing that's going to like completely break the game. I mean, if I can save before him, then I probably will, but... So these cutscenes were the very first full motion video cutscenes. 
there were motion videos before this, but they were on consoles that couldn't do real full motion video. So one of the one of the things on the back of the box that they they uh, bragged about, actually, on this on this it doesn't. It just says quite possibly the greatest game ever made. Um, but one of the things they bragged about when they did the advertisements and stuff for this game was that it was the first to have full motion video. And uh, they are legit FMVs. They play the the game calls just to play them. And then goes back to what it was doing. Um, I'm going to skip this because this sound effect's annoying. That should keep the planet going at least a little longer. Yeah. Okay, now everyone get back. Yeah, it's a common misconception that the game is three discs long because it's such a long adventure. But the only reason the game is three discs long is because of the FMVs. In fact... The entire code of the entire game is on all of the discs. Uh, the only difference between the discs are the FMVs that are on it. And the way they did it basically is they have like disc one with all of the code, and then it says like then it has like three FMVs on it: FMV one, FMV two, FMV three, and then disc two has all the code on it, and then it also has three FMVs on it, also called FMV one, FMV two, FMV FMV three. And then the code just calls FMV 1, 2, or 3, and depending on what disk is currently in the system, it'll play that FMV. So if you're about to watch an FMV and you switch the disks, it will play the wrong FMV. It'll play, it, it won't crash or anything, it'll just play the FMV 1 on disk 2 instead of the FMV 1 on disk 1. Um, and that's why during the speed run, when we wrong warp to the end of the game, we get the funny cutscenes where, like, Sephiroth's in the air, but there's, like, a train driving by. It's because it's trying to play FMV 1 on disc 3, which is, like, Sephiroth blowing up stuff, but instead it's playing FMV 1 on disc 1, which is, like, the Midgar train driving by. Alright, now let's get out of here. Rendezvous at Sector 8 Station. Split up and get on the train. Hey, if it's about your money, save it till we're back at the hideout. This is one of the scenes that I, I think was improved so much in the remake. Like, that scene is actually so much better in the remake. There's the loveless stuff. No, I was just using that as an example. There's like, I don't know, 9 or 10 FMB? Because there's... A lot of stuff is FMV that you don't think is FMV, like the train driving by is like an FMV even though it's really short. Um, <laughs> I think my favorite FMV, I ain't gonna let it get to me, I'm just gonna creep. Uh, I think my favorite FMV is uh, when you defeat, when you defeat Airbuster and the bridge blows up. That's actually an FMV <laughs> that plays over top the gameplay. It like blows up and the models like jump in. They kind of just made the models jump on their own field and then the FMV plays over it. And then after that it goes back to the field and then Cloud like lands on the on the bridge. But that little tiny like pew, is an FMV. Excuse me. What happened? So, uh, this game also uses a, uh, date mechanic, which actually isn't the first of the series, I don't think, because there is some kind of mechanic like that, um, I think in 6, sort of. I mean, eh, it's different. Um, here, this date mechanic number, um is kept throughout the whole game and there are a ton of things that affect it i think a lot of people think that it's just like what you choose here uh but there are a ton of things there's a bunch of different text with yuffie Aerith, tifa and barrett that all affect their own numbers and then there's also if uh every time they're in your party they get date points every time they faint they lose date point date points like stuff like that 
Um, I think I think that's right. I think feigning affects it. Um, <laughs> you guys want to do the Derrit? The Derrit bait? Uh, if we're going to do the Derrit bait, we can just do the glitch to get it automatically. There's, uh, yeah, that was another... So, this game had so many myths about it on the internet. Um, probably the most myths ever of any video game because this game was popularized when the internet was starting to get popularized. And so there are so many myths and like one of the myths of the 90s internet was that you could get a SID date in a uh, Red 13 date. But it's only Yuffie, Tifa, Aerith, and Barret. Um... And then also, of course, the rumors of saving Aerith were like... That was like the, the biggest video game rumor of all time, I think. And it's wild because now we actually can save Aerith, but it's complicated. <laughs> you don't really save her, you just skip the whole part where she dies. What's your favorite date? Um... I mean, I, I think it's got to be the Barrett date. The Barrett date is hilarious. Um, Yuffie's is pretty good, too. I always thought that Tifa's was, like, the best lore-wise. Like, I think it's the best one just for the game and its storytelling. But uh, Barrett's is hilarious. <laughs> it's hard not to like Barrett's. Um, well, let's see. If we're going for the Barrett date, then... We can say whatever we want to everyone. Uh, I kind of want to go for the Tifa date for the story. But I think everyone's seen the Tifa date plenty of times, so... Vote. Vote, 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 vote. Uh, little known fact, this guy has like a lot to say. Wonder what that is on the wall over there. Let's see. Don't be fooled by Shinra. Mako energy doesn't last forever. Mako is a planet's life source. The end is in sight. Protectors of the planet, Avalanche. So that's kind of cool. Hey, you there! So you can fight all these guys with Cloud, but it makes no difference. Oh yeah, the Mount Colts poster on the wall is a callback to Final Fantasy VI. Good call. Grab him! Yeah, I always fought these guys as a kid as well. Unfortunately, the glitch to get the Barrett date is so early on in the game that I can't, like, save and do it and then switch. We'd have to play a huge section of the game again. The the um, the glitch to get the Barrett date automatically is in Cosmo Canyon. Cloud never came. Cloud, wonder if he was killed. No way. Cloud. Oh my god, look at Big's face. <laughs> he has like giant Pac-Man eyes. Say, do you think Cloud's going to fight to the end for Avalanche? Heck what I know, do I look like a mind reader? If y'all weren't such screw-ups. Hey Barrett, what about our money? Uh, nothing, sorry. Ah! Is that you, Charlie Sheen? Cloud! Looks like I'm a little late. How's it going, Hitman? You're dang right, you're late! Come waltzing in here making a big scene. It's no big deal, just what I always do. Haven't everyone worried like that? You don't give a dang about yourself, about no one but yourself. Hmm, you were worried about me. What? I'm taking out of your money, hot stuff. Wake up! 
You're moving out. We're moving out. Follow me. Go Cloud Shrug. Hey, Cloud, you were great back there. Hey, <laughs> Cloud, we'll do even better next time. Be careful. I'll shut this. Oh, Cloud, your face is pitch black. There you go. Thanks, Jesse. Say, thanks for holding me back there at the reactor. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> that's another thing that is really annoying about the way they coded this game. So, they didn't come up with like a an algorithm or like a I guess a uh, an actual module isn't the right word, but some kind of coding mechanism that would allow the game to auto-size its text boxes. Uh, most RPGs you've ever played, it takes the text that the developer wants to place on the screen, and it just auto-places a text box around it to the correct size, right? And maybe if there's a lot of text, they need to split it into multiple text boxes or something. But for the most part, the game will automatically do that for them. So that games with this much text, you know, they can get through it. But they either didn't know how to do it yet, or because of the way they coded the game. Which, by the way, this game is coded like a giant document of if-then statements. It's bizarre. But because of the way they coded it... And because of the way the modules work, they had no way of auto-sizing the text boxes. So, every text box you see in this entire game was hand... You know, they they, lit, they made the text, and then they had to make an X-coordinate and a Y-coordinate. Based on, like, how big they wanted the box to be. So, they'd be like, okay, X is 100 and Y is 30. And then they'd look at it and see if all the text fits in it. And then they'd edit it, okay, 120 by 30 until the text was displayed. And they did that for every single text box in the entire game, which this game had an ungodly amount of text. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I've come up with a new Oh yeah, right. So the the XY is actually the position on the screen and then the height and the width, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So they had to do a width and a height until the text fit right and then an X and a Y to place it on the screen. And they had to do that for every single text box. And I kind of I kind of that it gives you an idea as to why this game was barely barely made its deadline <laughs> just from that alone last train out of sector 8 station last stop is sector 7 train graveyard expect the time of arrival is 1223 Midgar Standard Time I like how they say we're arriving at the train graveyard not just sector 7 like specifically the train graveyard as if anyone wants to go to the train graveyard Yeah, luckily the translation in this game actually is pretty good. We make fun of it a lot, but after playing the retro Final Fantasies, this one is by far better. This is why I hate the last train. Who boy? Why is his eyes so red? Are his eyes always that red? I remember that guy's eyes being so red. Oh my god, look at Cloud. <laughs> oh my god, this is killing me, dude. Like, the, the scart quality mixed with the models themselves because if we were playing this on like an old TV without with like component or composite cables it probably looked pretty pretty standard you know but here the actual resolution is so good because of the scart but the models are so bad like look at his eyeballs hold on I gotta zoom in I gotta zoom into this hold on His eyeballs look like... an Atari character. Look at those eyeballs! <laughs> They're just two dots! <laughs> it looks like an Atari character. You got a black dot, a blue dot, and then just dots for the eyebrows. Oh my god.
It's crazy how detailed they look when you get closer. So another uh, another um, little speedrun thing. There's a thing called Jesse Skip, where you can line up on a specific pixel here, and then talk to Jesse at the same exact time that this guy comes out and says, "Please, you're bothering the other passengers." And it overwrites the two text boxes, so you can start interacting with Jesse as if you're starting her cutscene, and then leave and come back, and the game updates as if you did Jesse's cutscene. And you don't have to listen to Jesse talk to you about trains for, like, two minutes. Hey, Cloud, do you want to look at this with me? It's a map of the Midgar Rail System. Let's look at it together. I'll explain it to you. I like this kind of stuff. Bombs and monitors, you know, flashy stuff. I still don't know how bombs and monitors, how these two things... <laughs> hey, Jesse, what do you like? Bombs and monitors. Those are my two favorite things. Okay, it's about to start. This is a complete model of the city of Midgar. It's about one ten thousandth scale. The top plate is about 50 meters above ground. The main support structure holds the plate up in the center, and there are support other support structures built in each section. The number one reactor we blew up was in the northern section. Then there's number two, number three, all the way up to number eight. The eight reactors provide Midgar with electricity. Each town used to have a name, but no one in Midgar remembers them. Instead of names, we refer to them by numbered sectors. That's the kind of place this is. Phew! This is next. Look. This is the route this train is on. The route spirals around the main support structure. We should be coming around the center area right now. At each checkpoint, an ID sensor device is set up. It can check the identities and background on each and every passenger on the train by linking it up to the central data bank at Shinra headquarters. Anyone could tell that we look suspicious, so we're using fake IDs. Yeah, for sure. We uh, we make fun of this Jesse scene a lot, but it, it is really cool how they explain Midgar. And Midgar is such an amazing concept, like, holy cow. That light means that we're in the ID security check area. When the lights go off, you never know what kind of creeps will come out. Anyhow, we're almost back now, that's a relief. Yeah, we talked about during the remake, they have that model, and they said what the scale was, and I think we... How, how big did we decide Midgar was? It was like 20 miles long or something, I can't remember what it was. But we had like an actual measurement. Yeah, it was like 27 miles across. Which sounds... sounds about right, when you think about it. Look, you can see the surface now. This city doesn't have, don't have no day or night. If that plate weren't there, we could see the sky. A floating city, pretty unsettling scenery. Huh? Never expect to hear that out of someone like you. You just full of surprises. We're never actually told too much about the upper plate. Um, I think it's supposed to be understood that the bottom under the plate are like the slums and poor people and yada yada and then the upper plate are like I guess middle class or just not slums poor but it's never really explained like if they're rich or just middle class up there and then Shinra's really the only rich ones or how many people actually live up there if it's the same as like the slums like they don't really go too much into the upper plate I guess because it's not relevant. The upper world is sitting on a plate. It's because of that dang pizza that people underneath are suffering. And the city below is full of polluted air. On top of that, the reactor keeps draining up all the energy. Then why doesn't everyone move on to the plate? Don't know. Probably because they ain't got no money. Or maybe... Because they love their land, no matter how polluted it gets. I know, no one lives in the slums because they want to. It's like this train, it can't run anywhere except where its rails take it. That's very profound, Cloud. Yeah, everything, every problem in Final Fantasy VII can be linked back to pizza. <laughs> He's talking about the plates, because they 
look like pizza, I guess. I like the idea that pizza is just, like, the actual problem, though. Like, all this happened because some pizza place went out of business. Genova appeared because she didn't have pizza. She wanted to get all of our pizza. When I was a kid, I had no idea what Barrett was talking about. I think most of us are in that. <laughs> are in that camp. Yo, get over here, all ya. This mission was a success, but don't get lazy now. The hard part's still to come. Don't y'all be scared of that explosion. Because the next one's going to be bigger than that. Meet back at the hideout. Move out. Dude, look at Wedge. Wedge just looks like a mangled mess of pixels. Good God. 